our annex at the library, where we have a live audience alongside those on Zoom for the 29th and last of our 2021 Invisible Histories talks. Our talks are free, but we do, of course, welcome our donations, and there's a donate button on our website. Today, we have a film screening and a discussion exploring the politics of working class storytelling. Amy Pennington will share work in progress excerpts from their new film, made in collaboration with their family. And we welcome back Lisa McKenzie to tell us about the project Lockdown Diaries of the Working Class. <laughs> After that, both speakers will have a conversation about the intricacies of working class storytelling. So I'm going to hand over directly to Amy. Uh, I have one that's to come in. So it's different selections of it, it's different clips because actually I thought I could make it in like a year, boy, I was wrong. It's going to be a long a long time maybe saying that my family are watching and they're probably like no it's not but um yeah so it came about because my mum was adopted at six years at six weeks old and around five years ago she found her biological family and we have come together and met with them and just think it's a story a working class story that needs to be told and how a lot of women I guess were made to give up their children and how this has impacted things. Um, I'm also interested in how we can tell these stories in complex ways that are not just sensationalized that show a kind of full picture of it. And so it really starts, it, you're gonna see bits where we've done a workshop together and there's microphones and there's kind of storytelling within that. And then there's gonna be parts where there's Zooms stuff that's been filmed quite documentary. And I'm really interested in stretching what it can be as a story. Um, so I think there's more to come with it. But yeah, so take this as like clips and uh, the beginning of almost. So yeah, so, and it's gonna be called, How Does It Feel? So we'll play it now. <laughs> well, there is a little prize potentially. Um, yeah, there's money in the budget because I've got funding to do this, believe it or not. You've uh, got money, money to listen, talk to your family? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quite straight. If you look at the, the bottom, too sparkly. I can't describe the earrings. Uh, studs. Um, if you imagine like a pineapple ring, they're kind of like that, but completely different colours. And I couldn't quite see, but I think you might have like the freckles within the eyes. Biking's like a, it's a unique thing. You can ride to somewhere and you know, on your own, and within a, a minute, somebody's talking to you and say, you know, and then they go, oh, I went there, or and before you know, you might even know somebody, you know, they know, and things like that. You know, whereas if you went to Ashbourne in your football focus, nobody would come up and say, oh, it's a lovely focus. And, start chatting to you about it but you know but bikes it's a big community you know
stane. Uh, Danny, if it wasn't for Danny, we wouldn't be here today because Danny was the only one in the family that had put herself on Facebook and doesn't put any filters on it so it was easy to find. It's only because I don't know how to. <laughs> <laughs> what I found through reading Danny's profile and what he put on Facebook was that he was someone who, and I knew what this would start, a very kind person. And when I had my doubts about finding everybody, I just kept looking and thinking, well, what is putting on this guy's the kindest man? His family means everything to him. He never put anything stupid, nasty or anything. He was just a really kind human being who loved his family. My fear was that this, how can we, or how can I, knock on somebody's door in a literal sense and say, well, I'm, I'm the sister that you don't know about. Uh, and if it hadn't been for Graham as well, I don't think I would have ever done it because of the pushing to... When we, when I read that our dad had died, Danny, because Danny put on um, Today I Lost My Hero and realised that someone else had in the family, so I'd lost, I'd not been able to meet my mum, I'd not been able to meet my dad. And Graham said, how many more people have got to die before, before you do something? But it took another 18 months to pluck up courage. Um, and in that time, I kept stalking Danny. <laughs> um, we even went to where we thought he was doing a race meeting in Mablethorpe, you know, looking for him. I don't think I'd have had the courage to to uh, to go and say hello, because how could I go and say hello and say hello, I think I'm your sister. It just wouldn't have been the right time. Um, so yeah, so the day that we met was just unbelievable. And I say Danny, obviously, all of us together. But Danny, I remember looking in his eyes and thinking, oh my God, he is really my brother. This person that I'd seen on on a screen for so long had actually become real. And he wasn't he wasn't this flat screened person. All of a sudden it was this person that was alive and talking and I remember well he insulted me the first within the first five minutes because just in case I was a a Knott's Forest fan, he would never he would have just walked away. We won't, um, we won't be here today. No, we wouldn't be here today. Um so I got away with that one quite lightly. Graham isn't home, I'm sorry. It's all right, he's texted me. Oh has he? Do you know what time he's coming though? Because I've not got a clue. Oh, I'm thinking half an hour. Oh, is it? Yeah. yeah. No more than me then. Not be a minute. I bet his tea's not on. It's not. Not the two. <laughs> not the two things at once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the Yorkshire that she won't admit. Can't do two things at once. <laughs> <laughs> I don't talk like that. So she shouldn't. I'm going to the shop. <laughs> Why do you not say tut? I'm going to the shop. Oh. I'm going to the shop. <laughs> so that's interesting, Amy. Do you think me and Diane have got a Derby accent then? Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. completely different from Nottingham, Yorkshire and all that. It, it's, yeah, it's got so, its own twang. Yeah, because, I mean, I've been you know, like in Spain, say, and a bloke said to me, you're from Derby, like, yeah. looked and gone out. And he said, you're not from Chad, are you? I went, look at that. <laughs> Honest. 
to do you remember? Yeah. It, it, took one, off... it took one look at you. And he... <laughs> well, yeah, that, that's probably it, yeah. So if you're standing and you probably remember I'd be I'd be surprised if they don't mention that with you. What does the soundtrack go like? Oh, I'll get it on for you. Can you sing it? Can you hum it? I'm gonna have to play it now, so you do know it there. But I'll play it for the sake of the film. I will put it on. Capri Dark Milk. That's not how it starts. <laughs> that's YouTube for you. Ever made. Now available as desserts. Made with melted Capri dark milk chocolate. It's a bit grown up. Find the dark milk desserts in the chill aisle at your local supermarket. Oh my god. This makes me it's hard. Ew, the song that reminds you of somebody. Yeah, I can't believe anything. Not all the sight in a bad way. Just like. Uh... I don't know, I'm fucking stuck here. It's big as me. Near enough. Since what? 12? Well, How would the running around go? Yeah. Yeah. Even with the bad leg. Give me the back leg. So I guess I want to bring you here because there's a lot down there is working class and I'm really interested in your interest in telling working class stories and I just thought it would be good to get you here and chat about it because even on our Zoom when we first met it just triggered loads of thoughts and different things of how I guess I can take the film and mm -hmm. made me think lots about it in different ways. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Amy, for, uh, I mean, I didn't know Amy until she, till they, no, I've done that, till they, till, till, till they contacted me. Um, and then we had a Zoom call and we just started to find out we've got loads in common, really. Um, and I think that's one of the things about working class storytelling is you've got to actually meet and talk to each other. And you start to find out that there is so many class commonalities that your experiences of being working class actually is not this sort of individual experience. You know, your family is not, you know, it's the quirkiness or the, the way that your families have managed or the way that they, um, you know, talk or do things or eat. <laughs> or cook, yeah. or the things that we like, the sort of food that we eat, and the music we listen to. You know, just listening to that one clip, I can see a lot of commonality with your mum. You know, I remember Black Beauty and doing that, <laughs> doing that sort of jump around the house. Um, you know, and, and so I think one of the things well, for working class people and for those of us that are interested in telling working class stories is we have got to reach out and we've got to meet and we've got to talk and we've got to share these stories that's kind of the first thing that we've got to do um and i'm going to say something quite controversial now but i'm going to say it we've got to do that with the ex excluding middle class people we have got to do that and I'm not saying that because, you know, and I want to exclude people. It's just that over the years, working class stories get done down and retold and, and they go through like a machine process 
of, well, this bit's not funny, or this bit's funny, or, you know, we need more sex in it, or we need more violence in it. And one of the things I've always said about working class storytelling is working class life for working class people is not full of sex and violence and criminality. You know, 90% of our lives is boring. <laughs> you know, working class people do mundane jobs. You know, we, 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 our, our focus is usually very much around our communities and our families. We spend a lot of time with the same sort of same people. Um, we tend to go to the same sort of pubs. You know, we don't have these interesting, you know, lives going off on, you know, that we're not we're not made in Chelsea. <laughs> and so, you know, any any story that I read or any thing that I watch, and you know, and ninety percent of it is about you know, criminals or drug mm -hmm. dealing or, you know, excitement. I know that that's not really come from working class people because most of my day, for most of my life, has been going from the fridge to the telly and back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and I think, you know, that, that sort of time scale, you know, what we actually do, um, you know, it's sometimes too boring or, or not a message for those that want or think they want our stories. Mm. So I think I'm gonna give you so much credit there because what you've done is just, a, you know, it's just a family. Mm. It's just a normal family going through, for most working class people, a normal process mm. of meeting a strange family. Mm -hmm. But it's an extraordinary story as well. Yeah, it, it holds those two things yeah. together. Yeah. And I think the film like, I want those boring bits in it. I mean, we were talking like the other day. There's it's not boring though, is it? It's us. It's yeah, who we yeah. are. It's not boring. And I think we are, we're told that these are boring bits because they're not interesting. You know, to, you know, they're not they're not interesting perhaps to an audience that doesn't understand yeah. it and doesn't feel it. Well, that kind of daily minutia then, or like that daily thing of I think that's why like Gogglebox and Royal Family hit such a chord and. I think there's something that reminds me of that in this thing that I'm trying to make here. Like mm -hmm. some of when I guess lockdown was at its peak, I had to do a lot of things on, on Zoom. And looking back at some of these kind of workshop sessions I did with them on Zoom was like, you know, somebody's just talking about curtain rails, like for a good 25 minutes that I went mm -hmm. through. And there's something brilliant about that. Yeah. Like I want to try and include yeah. that in it. Yeah. Because it's all part of it. Yeah. And I yeah. think that it's, that's what I think about the complexities of things. Like things are so sensationalized and, and it is so good to really spend time with like a film. I think that's what I'm learning. Like spend time with these stories. It's not going to be done in nine months. Like it, to really mm. understand it and to really try and show it in some way is just going to take a lot longer. Yeah. And yeah. it's going through all of that and also not extracting things from people. Yeah. So like working with my family to, because at the start they were like, but what are we doing? And I think with my work, sometimes I don't even know. So it's really process based. So I'll be like, I'll try that. And then if that doesn't work, I'll switch it. Or, and with that, I, that's really hard for them to understand because it's like, well, we want to know what we're doing. Now it's from like nine months to a year. I think they're getting it more now and they're getting involved with it. And when like you saw the bit of my mum doing, speaking in the microphone, that was that whole day workshop that was facilitated by another artist. It was absolutely amazing. And I think that they would never have had that experience if it wasn't for, for this film and yeah. bringing them into that. And that I think was a great experience for them to all have because it was just so different from daily life, you know? Yeah. I think you're right about the time um, and the time that it takes to not extract. And those of us that are, working class and we, we're we still part of our communities and we want to tell our stories. I think we're all really aware not to extract. That's one of the things that none of us ever want to do. We never just want to extract, pull out um, and take. Mm. That is, that is and, I, and I think working with working class people over many years, that is the commonality I've always found. Mm is that no one wants to do that. Equally, I've worked with other people 
that do do that mm. and want that. And that's where I start. That's where over the years I've started to make some distinctions. Yeah. And, and that's why I said initially we have to tell these stories together and sometimes to the exclusion of middle class people because that extraction process starts to come in really quickly. You know, I've been in how many rooms have I been in? And like, you know, you start telling your story. And me, I can I can tell a story for four hours. <laughs> and I promise you, you'll still be saying this thing because it'll go everywhere. But, you know, and you'll join in and you'll go, oh, yeah, I remember I did that. And, and the story gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I think that, you know, that fairy tale, uh, Stone Soup. I cannot know <laughs> it's a, it's a, so basically it's a, somebody comes to town and they've got no, they've got no but a stone so they go around knocking on people's doors going can I have some food I've got no food and everybody goes no you know <laughs> I'm not interested so they start so the person puts a stone in a pot and starts going, mm, this is lovely, this is mm. And then somebody comes out and says, oh, if I give you some carrots, can I have a bit of your stone soup? And then eventually you've got like this, you know, wonderful soup and everybody comes out and everybody sits around talking about the soup. And I just find that that is how we could, that's how we as working class people create things. We very rarely, we're not good at doing it on our own, I don't. Um, we do like to get involved and like everybody to get involved and we're so much richer because we do that um, and I've just sat in too many rooms where people have kind of gone what's the point though mm -hmm. you know where are we going with this how will the ending look you know I remember telling somebody about a story that I've got that I was interested in doing and it was a story about the minor strike about this year and mm -hmm. this year in the minor strike and I kind of think somebody I met somebody from Channel Five or somewhere, and it was like, yeah, but what's the conclusion? It's like lost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was history. It's, yeah. you can't do an episode about that. <laughs> but that's not the point. The conclusion, the end, isn't the. It's the story. Mm -hmm. It's not that end bit. I think that's the thing with TV as well and things like that. It is just so can be not always, but can be so reductive to that yeah. kind of money shot or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's why I like when the Black Beauty bit's on and I even put in like the Cadbury's advert. Was that, that you, Maxine? That Cadbury's advert. Can you say that was not an essence? I was like, yeah, that's <laughs> 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 I think that like even leaving that bit in, even just having the advert play out would never get in like a typical documentary. It'd be like, no, it needs to be more to the point. It yeah. needs to fit yeah. within these 24 yeah. minutes. What's the story? Where is it yeah, going? Exactly. And, and those of us, you know, and most of us know that stories don't happen that way, do they? They, they meander and they go off. And sometimes they don't end. Mm. You know, I know when people are asking me about, I mean, the many I, I, I've collected, thousands of working class stories over the last 20 years and people always want to know how it ends and it's like it's not you know it's not ended you know and the, the fact that we're in here mm -hmm. you know in a building that has collected that's got collections of working class stories over generations and generations you know and we're still here today start talking about new stories mm -hmm. um, and we can all trace our stories to many things in this place yeah and so i never see that we are you know that we are reformed stories you know we mm -hmm. sort of meander and go on and i think that's the beauty of working class storytelling and how did like the lockdown diaries come about for you how did the beginning of that story come about well i don't even introduce myself I? <laughs> <laughs> just an assumption uh my name is lisa mckenzie i'm um i'm an ethnographer and I, I tell stories, mostly unemployable, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I'm a working class academic and um, I've collected working class stories, well, all my life. Um, and this is why I'm interested in working class stories, because, you know, from 
being a very, very small child, and I know every single one of us in this room will have this story, sitting in families or sitting in canteens or cafes or, you know, and listening stories over and over again people so it's usually and with your family it's the same stories week in and week out you know when they did this when did the and you find your place in the world because of those stories you know who you are not because anybody's saying this is who you are this is how you, you were created this is where you belong and this is what you're going to do it's through the stories of the family or the community and you find your place in that. So I've been doing it all my life. You know, when you start off in the room, you know, in my, in my case, it was always loads of aunties mm -hmm. smoking. You know, there'd be like 20 women in our front room smoking. And it was brilliant if you were a nosy kid, because you could, I could allow them to smoke. <laughs> and they, could, they wouldn't see me. Because <laughs> the smoke was sort of all appear sort of this level. And then as a kid, we could we found out. We found out things like your family, mm -hmm. who'd who'd been adopted. Yeah. You know, who'd give kids up. Uh I mean, I found out that I've got two, I've got a brother and a sister through through that process. Mm -hmm. Um that like your mum, you know, they had been sort of almost forcibly given up, really. Um and you know, when we found out, we found out the family secrets. Mm. You know, and that was through through being able to lie under sort of twenty women's fag smoke. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and these are our stories. Yeah. These are, you know, I, my mate, my best mate. I remember like this is a fantastic story. God, I hope she knows my kid. No, she won't. She we talk about it, laugh about it all the time. <laughs> but we used to do something called again routine. I don't know if anybody did routine as a kid. Like when your mum and dad was out. Or my mum did rooting, that's how she fancied Yeah, <laughs> yeah, rooting. Yeah. So I don't know if any, so when your mum and dad's out or when, you know, grown ups are out, you go through all the wardrobes and find, find stuff. Yeah. So me and my mate was doing it in her house and we found her birth certificate, we got a birth certificate out and it said a different name on it. And she was like, who the fuck's that? Yeah. And it was like, it was her. Yeah. And it was like, it's you. <laughs> and she was like, well, who's that name there? Because she thought her name was one thing, yeah. but actually it was somebody else. And the name, her second name, was the same second name as the lodger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, and, and, we were, and I was like, Bill's your dad. And, and it, but he'd always been the lodger. Um, but again, it wasn't what it first seemed. You know, mm. if we were to make a if we were to do a little short film about that thing, you know, it'd be like, oh, look at her, you know, oh, you know, working class woman putting it back. That's not what the case yeah. was. Her husband, my, my friend's husband, had, my friend's mum's husband had been killed down the pit. Mm -hmm. And if she married again or if she'd had a partner, she would have lost his pit pension. So officially, my friend couldn't belong to her dad, even though he lived there. Yeah. And he had to be the lodger because it was the only way that he could survive. And so that's always the bit of the story that's not there, isn't it? Yeah. It's always that bit. Yeah, yeah. So coming back to the lockdown diaries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forget, it was the beginning of lockdown. It was when it's March 20, whatever it was. And I was just sat at home. I lived in Durham then. I was sat completely on my own thinking, watching the telly like we all were, watching... Boris and you know all the other sort of saying things and I just kept hearing this stuff over and over again saying things this is what's happening this is what and I was like this is not what's happening this is what's happening for you mm. this is what's happening to you and this is what you want us to know and I knew that there would be people all over the country who've got their own stories that would not be told um, and I don't know if you any of you have ever come across the uh mass observation studies. Um, so they were, so in the Second World War, uh, it was government scheme actually, I mean, they didn't have to do something like that. No, but it was mass observation and people just wrote diaries. So they wrote a diary, sent it into a government office in London mm -hmm. and they were just stored away. Very little has been done with them, but you can actually, you can go to the archives and find them. Um, and 
so many of the war stories are absolutely mm. smashed by people's testimony. And one of the things that I did find, because I'm writing another book, which will come out next year, uh, about London. And one of the things, that, and I lived in the East End for about <coughs> seven years, and you know that sort of Second World War story about, you know, the Cockney spirit and the East Enders, and they're all sort of getting on with it, and the Blitz spirit. You know, I read testimony from people who lived there. That was not the case. That was not the case at all. People were living in squalor. Um, there was thousands of people down the tubes with were living in insanitary conditions. The rich were all in Mayfair continuing to have parties, sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> you know, parties and food and, and luxuries were still going on in other parts of London, while in, in the East End, working class people were living in squalor. They wanted the war to end. Mm -hmm. They weren't, they didn't want to continue and they weren't, they weren't doing this sort of glorious fight. They were utterly miserable and unhappy mm -hmm. um, and angry. And they were extremely angry at Churchill. Churchill, again, was not the great hero that we, we've come to believe that he was, not for working class people. So Again, where are these stories though? Because the national narrative always takes over. And that's what I wanted to do with the Working Class Diaries, is make sure that those stories are somewhere. Um, it started off with just asking people to write diaries, so people did, and sent me diaries in. And when I got on, I was like, totally, I didn't realize what would happen. You know, I do interviews and everything, and I do interviews and meet people talk and, and um, but when you get a piece of, when somebody writes something to you and they're like, dear Lisa, mm. you know, today's not been a good day. I've not been able to get out of bed today. It's like, you know, yeah. that was a different level really. And I knew I had to really be respectful and think about these stories in perhaps a different way than I've done before. Uh, and I knew the one thing that I did know that the academic process could not have it you know, there's no way the academic process could, be, could have been involved in that at all. I think that's one of the fantastic things that you've got. You get, you're the master of this. You get to say what goes in it. Yeah. Um, where so much of what we do now, you know, funders get in the way. Yeah, and I think that <laughs> that's been like an issue with this, trying to get this funded and it not be, they just don't understand it, you know. It's difficult. Yeah, yeah, it is difficult. It is difficult. So you know, I decided to not do that, and I, and I did a Kickstarter. Um, and you know, it was horrible. I'll be honest. I hated every second of doing it. I felt like I was begging. Yeah, I, I, I did. I felt like I was begging. I hated it. I was begging people for money. I was begging friends for support. I was just. It was. I tell you, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I would have rather robbed a bank. <laughs> I'm being serious now. Do you know the, and you know what? And I'm, I'm realizing that you, this is the way we act. You know, I preach all this solidarity stuff and say we've got to look after you and we've got to do this together. But when it comes to asking for stuff, <laughs> it's just horrible. And again, speaking to working class people, I don't know what we do about that. Because we've got to do something about that. Because, you know, the other lot, I've no problem. Yeah. You know, well, they, they meet him within five minutes. They're going, yes, give me your card. I'll do the, you know, we'll do this. And they're on the phone the next day, yeah. you know, or emailing. I met you yesterday. We said we'd do that. Whereas, you know, for us, it's just crippling. Yeah. It's just absolutely crippling. So, I, again, I just want to throw that out. You know, what do we do about that? How do we get over that? Um, and a lot of that's through private schools and now you're, I think, yeah, I do. within that. And yeah, with it's, that, a, it's um, a cultural element. You know, so yeah. when I say to you, to anybody here, I felt like, they, I felt, I literally felt like I was on the street with a bowl. I hated it. Yeah, I imagine there's lots of people here who gets that, who would get that, that, you know, you know, I always think about it, it's like my uncles when they used to go to the bar. I have seen my uncles physically fight over whose turn, whose round it is. It's mine, no, it's mine. And the thought of somebody paying for, you know. Yeah. It, and and you, when you come from these really strong traditions, it's just so you can't just flip into another world yeah. and be something else. So again, I, I think, you know, if we're gonna start telling working class stories then we're gonna start, start dealing with each other. And mm -hmm. Somehow we've got to figure that out. 
I don't know what it is, but we've got to figure it out. Um, and also once I started reading the diaries as well, if they were alive, they started to come alive. And I knew that any dead piece of academic work would kill them and it would not be how I wanted. Um, so I kind of had this idea that it'd be a graphic novel. And uh, again, I just put out on social media, does anybody want, can anybody draw? Because I can't do it. <laughs> and I just got incredible people coming back to it. One of them is Lucy, who's here. <laughs> Hi, Lucy. <laughs> and if you haven't seen Lucy's work, please follow her on Instagram. It's Lucy Morris. Uh, she, she, is that your birthday? <laughs> is that uh, Lucy, Lucy's work refers back to the 1950s uh, kitchen sink dramas. So even though she might be doing work about contemporary working class Britain, the naughty girls are laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and even though she might be doing work about contemporary working class Britain, all her work references those 1950s uh, sort of kitchen sink dramas. And when and I interviewed Lucy for the book, and she's in the book, and she said it just, and again, you know, she's a young woman, but she just imagines that that period, that, that post war period, was probably quite a nice time for working class, or better than it is now for working class people. Um, I'm not sure that it was, but you know, from where we're, from this, from our standpoint now, you know, it was definitely a period of, there was some opportunities happening, particularly in the arts, whereas today that's been completely closed down. Mm. So, um, so anyway, that's the book, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. It's, it. It'll be. It's. It's currently in production. It's going to be published. Yeah, we've published. I'm publishing it myself. A collect. We've got a collective called the Working Class Collective. Uh, I'm hopefully going to continue doing more projects with that. I've got to figure out how to find money because I can't do begging again. Um, Pardon? <laughs> Robert Bang. I, I can understand, you know, the anarchists and the, like the anarchists uh, last century, that's what they would do. And I totally get that. Because I, I, I can't learn anymore, but anyway, I completely understand why you would rob a bank for your cause. I can completely understand that. <laughs> We've got a question, question on the chat, which I, I think is uh, of interest. Sir. Are these stories easier to collect if the collector is part of the family and community, or is it easier if someone is coming in from outside? Do different stories get told to an outsider? Mm -hmm. well, you've done the fun there. Yeah, I mean, for me, it feels important, I guess, that it was uh, from me and my family, because I think there is that fear of somebody else coming in and doing this extracting thing or just not quite getting it right and i think like you were saying earlier it's nice to have like ownership of it and you like pull the strings within it within it and also to just think about really reflecting on what you make and like people properly seeing it back and i know that when we did like the day workshop so many things were in there that just won't get shown mm -hmm. because it's so personal and i think that that's important to be like that's okay and we'll use what people feel comfortable with and there's so much that you can film that is rich in you know heartfelt and funny and sad and it's got all those things that yeah I think it's important with this specific project for me to kind of yeah. hold that with my family Could you tell, sorry, you tell us yeah 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 sure Can so to say to people who want the question uh i can't really remember what the question somebody's was. just somebody's just asked yeah no no, no what no, the no. process oh yeah, what max was saying yeah oh, right. maxine was saying um <laughs> what the process was of the workshop so the workshop was with an artist called joshua speyer and i'd done a workshop with him about oh, four years ago now with my mom and it was for artists and artists Mm. It was for artists and non-artist family members. So you take with your, your family that has got nothing to do with art. Um, so me and my mum did that for five days and it was really like amazing, lots of different techniques. And then I asked Joshua to come for this kind of film and do the day. Um, so a lot of it was kind of taste, taken from Augusto 
well um the, uh, the oppress some of the exercises from that so that's what that mirror exercise comes from and then um there was and i think it was all about getting people that had never done performance before to start performing their own stories so the day started with uh you've got to go up to the microphone and he showed you how to put the microphone up because that's intimidating for somebody that's never done it i mean my family do karaoke, but that's in a different world, you know? So it was like how to hold it. And the first exercise was to go up to the microphone and order your lunch. So it started with kind of small bits like that. And by the end, I think we did a lot of things like that. And then one of the exercises which, which thought was really good was to pick a track of music and to try and talk for the whole bit of the music. Um, so you were kind of t telling the story of where the song came from, what it, what the memories are for you. So my auntie talked about going to like Butlins with her husband and these type of things. But, you know, it, quite something if you're not an actor or if you're not an artist to go up and then tell these stories. So I guess getting comfortable with each other, with performing, with a microphone, using these techniques that they'd never used before. So it was really interesting. And he said that it was like, it's better than anything he'd seen taking it to like central school or like taking it to anywhere like that at an acting place. Cause these were proper real stories. And there wasn't, I guess if you're doing it in front of uni students, they're all trying to up each other up or, you know, I've got this where these were just like genuine stories that were told really from the heart. And I think that that really, yeah, held its own within that context. I'd love to do that. Not for me, but yeah, it, with people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it it was really bonding. I think that there was things shared there that would never have got shared would, in that would, way. It would be hard though to get some people into that room, though, wouldn't it? That's yeah, definitely. And I think I've been really lucky with the dynamics of my family that yeah. they were willing to do that, and and they did it for me. Yeah, I think yeah. which was really like heartfelt, and also a lot of responsibility because I was like, oh my god, what if I hate it? Yeah, but. Yeah. You know that they are very up for it, and I'm very lucky for like that. Yeah. And maybe that's because they've only known each other five years, and if they've known each other the full six, they'd be like, "For God's sake, <laughs> yeah. yeah!" But you know, I will work with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think continuing that question about would other people? I mean, there's, there, there's there's two arguments to that. That you know that sometimes you can be so familiar with. A, this is an academic argument that I don't actually buy, but sometimes you can be so familiar, you miss things. And you do, you do miss things. Um, she just said, still waiting to get paid. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, still oh, waiting oh, to get paid. Oh, oh, right. Waiting a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I just pay him. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, the academic, the academic argument about, you know, the outsider coming in is that they get to see something new. Mm -hmm. But I think for most of our stories, we still haven't got to tell the old story yet. So, you know, the, the obvious stuff is still not, you know, we've spoken over and the stories are not, mm -hmm. we don't connect with. I tell you, I remember being during this event in Manchester a few, well, probably about six years ago, and it was just after that programme, People Like Us. Did anybody see it? It was it was a, it was just before the Benefit Street stuff, so it was one of them. What's it called? What's it called? People like us. Yes, yeah. So it was like one of them flat documentaries looking at a council estate. Wait, look, wait. People like us. No, not that. That's. That's people just do nothing, yeah. So and I, and I went to that place where they filmed this thing, and I'd got and I'd gone with this academic, like it's an academic thing. Um, and they're all academics on the panel, except for one sort of community, it's like social worker or something. And one of the things that came out on this, and the, this panel was about telling working class stories, because mm -hmm. we keep having this conversation, <laughs> but not with, with each other. So I was on this panel, they're all academics, except for this one social worker or something, and um, they are, the, the audience actually had come from, came from the local area. And somebody on the panel, not me, because I would know better, said, 
oh, benefit street, oh, it's terrible, it's so exploitative, rah, 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 you know, we hate that, it's so exploitative of the working class. Mm -hmm. Somebody in the audience put their hand up and went, hang on a minute, we did, we had people like us here, and we, I was in it, and I really liked it because I could do my singing on it. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do karaoke and that. And a lot of the people in the audience, they said, yeah, there is exploitative, and they do come in and they take things from us. Mm -hmm. But when else do we see us on the mm -hmm. telly in our way, in our voice? Mm -hmm. um, and they absolutely shut the academics up, mm -hmm. you know, and said, listen, you know what? You can't be telling us what what we want to see or what we do. And I was just like, I was killing myself because I expected that. I yeah. knew that there was one lad in the audience who'd he kind of made a bit of a karaoke career out of it. Yeah, so yeah. for him, it was like me yeah. and my family's done this has been really good for us. Yeah, yeah. So so and I thought it would do them good to hear. Yeah. You know, you don't get to tell everybody. Yeah, what you think, your platform, yeah, yeah. you don't get around. to tell people how they are exploited because yeah, yeah. sometimes you don't know. Yeah, so I think, I think you know, I think it's time for us. I'm not saying we don't work with people wider, I'm saying that sometimes at the core, we've got to, it's got to be us at the moment. I think it's got to be, I think we're, I think working class people in this country are in such every single piece of power, we've got no power. When we've got access to nowhere, things have been closed off year after year after year that where we might have had some access. I think we're in a dire situation. So I think we, you know, the, the, there has got to be a fight back. And I don't think we can do it half heartedly. Have we got any other questions from? Our audience here in the annex, folk on Zoom, if you want to put something in the chat as a question or comment, then please do. Yes. Well, just a comment that it is um, the BBC or these types of places, well, the whole gallery system will they'll want our stories, but they'll, I always say they're like, show us your trauma, show us your yeah. trauma working for people, show us your trauma, show us what we want to see. And, so I say, fuck the gallery system, I'll have nothing to do with it. And I, because to apply for stuff, well, they squeeze you into boxes and they want to see certain bits of you, but not other bits. And um, yeah. yeah, so it's very much like, fuck middle class people telling our stories anymore. Like, show us your trauma, I'm coming to do a workshop here and like patronize a, a community of people and extract, like, look what they did, how crass is this, and they're doing that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Ooh. I'm angry. Yeah. Coco, 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 could you hear that? Okay, give, it, give us a bit. No. Okay. Could you summarize while 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 Coco, 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 Coco. Coco. Sorry, Sorry, what's your name? Kate. Kate. Yeah. From Huddersfield. Kate from Huddersfield has basically said that you know she kind of agrees with the um tell our stories. We've got to be quite angry about that because there's a lot of extraction and. You feel like, I don't know, you that, but you feel like, um, you know, people are always trying to extract the trauma. And that is true. I mean, you know, I don't know if I'm Poverty, poverty, porn, yes. poverty yeah. that's what poverty porn yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's about extract, but it's also about, because you find yourself watching these things and there's, there's these flip sides, there's these constant flip sides, all oh, these people are really bad, but they've got a bigger heart. Mm. And these nice things happen as well. And they're all manufactured stories because we have got all of that stuff, but there's a lot of other things in the, in the middle that, you know, that, that you know, and, and there's the hero and the villain. Yeah. And everything is very binary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why? You know, everything is very binary. This is a bad person. This is yeah. a good person. This is, you know, this is one stereotype. This is another. Yeah. And our stories are far more complicated. Yeah. Than and that. there's always the, oh, they've made it. Well, yeah. As well. Yeah. 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 Well, that's not the ending bit. Isn't yeah. It? yeah. There's always got to be that redemption at the end. Yeah. You know, you've got to have made good. Yeah. And actually, I, I, you know, one of the things, sometimes people just die. Mm. Um, you know, I've got a story from this bloke that I used to meet him once a week in this cafe in Bethnal Green. And I did that thing of, tell me, tell me, tell me the story. We were eight weeks in and we got to 1964. And I've got, I've got hundreds of hours of this interview. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and he just died. Wow. He had an heart attack. He died. We only got to, I think, 1980. Yeah. And he just died. 
and that was it. You know, he's, he's not in the <laughs> It's funny. <laughs> but that's that's the story. That's the end. You know, he had this life and you know, and he had an art, he lived on his own and he used to come to the cafe every day for company. He met me and I would sit and listen to him and then he just died and that was it. And you know, where's the redemption story in that? You know, he was, he, he was born poor in Glasgow and he died poor in Bath and Green. Yeah. Sorry, that's not very accurate. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but you know, it's not everybody, you know, unlike Charles Dickens, I don't need to write that we then found our adopted middle class family and went and lived happily <laughs> ever after. Well, that's what my mum said. She, yeah. she was like, well, well, we're definitely not. What is the one where it's the, the one that's ha got all the money? Miss Havershaw or something oh, yeah, like that. Yeah. It's like, it's, we've definitely not found that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and most of us don't, you know, yeah. most of us don't, you know, get returned to the, you know, yeah. we just, uh, we stay where we are, we make the best of life. <laughs> we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, anyone? <laughs> yeah. Are you family watching it for the first time now? No. What, what do they think of it? I'm probably here now. Uh, can you respond to repeat the question? I'll repeat yeah. the question. Larry at the back says, um, am I family watching it for the first time and can they respond to it? <laughs> um, they're not watching it for the first time because I showed it them uh, on Sunday because I wanted to check that everybody was all right with it. <laughs> um, and I don't know if they can really respond to it because uh, I guess it would be in the chat, but we can... We could, we could unmute anyone who wants to, if anybody wants to. Mum, are you up for it? <laughs> <laughs> Not to be honest, but... Dian, Dian, She's not unmuted herself. Mum, you need to unmute yourself. <laughs> there we go, look, I can ask you to unmute yourself. Dian will do it. Dian, she's not unmute herself. Dian will do it. Can you unmute yourself, Mum? I have to. Oh, right, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear Larry's ask you a question? <laughs> Can you say it again, Laura, please? Larry from Nuneaton. Larry from Nuneaton asks. Uh, <laughs> what do you think of the film, really? What do you think of the film, dot, 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 really? <laughs> really. Um, well, I'm, I'm very proud of what Amy's... Uh, obviously, but... Um, for me personally, I don't like looking at myself on the film. Um, but um, I love what the angle that she's she's got on it because, like Amy said, we didn't understand what she was doing, and and I don't think Amy did at first. Um, but I love the fact that it's that it is just about a working class family and our story, um, and I think. Um, you know, we've been very lucky to have sort of have brought the family together. Uh, like Amy said, the day that we had in Joshua's workshop was was just amazing. And, you know, we, we were really all open to what was happening and none of us knew really what was going to happen. Um, and the, it was very emotional, very emotional day. And me watching the film back, I cry every time. I mean, I, cry, I might be crying because I think I look such a bloody mess, but <laughs> that, I think, no, I, it makes me cry. It makes me laugh. It makes me smile. Um, and I'm proud of being working class and I'm proud of the family that I've found and that I've, you know, become part of. Um, I think, you know, we've all, within the family, we've all got our own stories as well, which is really interesting. And and obviously, Amy will probably get all those stories, you know, together at some point. But we've all got our own stories within the story, if that makes sense. Where did Auntie Di go? She's just made a coffee. She's coming back. Yeah, we've been. <laughs> yeah. You want to say anything, Auntie Di? Um, um, 
well, I'm very proud of you, obviously. And it's really interesting listening to, is it Lisa? Yeah. I could listen to you all day. I know I'm good. Really good. Really I'm, I'm sure. I'm in. I'm in. Uh, not. I'm in Gedling. Oh, right. I don't know Gedling. Do you know Gedling? I know of it. Yeah. I'm from Sutton That's... in Ashfield. Do you know? Sutton? Oh yeah, I know Sutton in Ashfield. Yeah, I'm from Sutton. Um, I'm going to yeah, invite you down the tab. Definitely come to tavern. Definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm in. Do you like karaoke? Yes. There oh, we go. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but um. But no, it's really interesting. I love what you're doing and, and, and about the working class film. It, it's true about middle class people making working class films. And I like, I like what you're saying about they, they take things out that they think they, we, we want to see and it's not necessarily real. And it's, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic project. And it's really good. I'm, I'm glad I'm part of it. And, and, you know, I'm glad Amy's doing what she's doing. And we were all nervous. Um, but Amy's done it in such a natural way that I think you can see in some of it, like me doing the bloody Black Beauty thing. I knew I was being filmed, but I forgot, you know, and it was just, <laughs> that's what you want, isn't it? You want it to be real. I think it's a good job, but yeah, definitely me talk with you, Lisa, definitely. Well, we're all getting you down the tab now. I'll come. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I go anywhere around the you know. <laughs> Thanks, Diane D. Okay. That doesn't sound like it can. Questions? Anybody else want to unmute themselves? Zoom or anybody else here? Yeah. Right. There you go, Diane D. You've had the last word. Right. Okay. So I would like very much to thank uh, both Amy and uh, Lisa. Indeed, Sophie, who's, who's behind the scenes been doing the tech for us. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to our audience here and our audience on Zoom. The last talk of uh, today, so it's great to have so many people here, here in the annex and to, to know that you've, you've, you've drawn a crowd, both virtual and real. So thank you so much. Important, important work and important stories. And yeah, it is. Thank you for saying it's the right place for it because yeah, we love, we love that. Thank you. <laughs> So if you join us late, folks, or if you want to recommend this to others, this talk has been recorded and we'll be uploading it to the library YouTube channel with a link on the event web page. And I've forgotten my video. That's true. But again, thank you. Um, so this has been the last talk, as I say, in our 2021 series. And we expect to pick up again on the 23rd of February, 2022. <laughs> You can find out more on the What's On page of our website. So till then, best wishes to you all in solidarity from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Yay!